Welcome to the Grief Dreams podcast. Thanks for tuning in. This is where we have conversations with guests about life, loss, grief, and grief dreams, which can be dreams of your loved ones that have passed away. So if you want to know more about the topic, you can definitely check out our website, griefdreams.ca, for more information. And here are four ways you can help support the podcast and help us spread awareness on this amazing topic. So number one, subscribe and rate the podcast on the platform that you listen to it on. Number two, become a member of the podcast, and that's for as low as $1.50 a month. This helps us run the podcast, and you can find the Patreon link in the show notes. Number three, you can take the Grief Dreams online course by Dr. Joshua Black at griefdreams.ca. And lastly, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Clubhouse, and Facebook at Grief Dreams. And now on to the show. The new beginning. Welcome to the Grief Dreams podcast. My name is Sean Ram alongside Dr. Joshua Black. Nice to be here podcasting and happy to have you guys all along on today's episode we have with us autumn Tolly jackson and she has lived a life of love and loss filled with happiness and marked by tragedy labels are too simple but they do have meaning and they do tell part of her story wife widow mother survivor the loss of a husband a beloved cousin and mentor her daughter and miscarriages have left scars on her soul and memorial tattoos on her body but autumn learned to grow through it all she found love and reasons to get up each day until those days strung into weeks, then months, then years. She wrote boldly into the darkness, living with loss, growing with grief, and holding on to happiness to share her story and let others who are grieving know they aren't alone, and even with loss, there is hope. Autumn and her family created Growing With Grief to provide those who are grieving with a place to find community, resources, and help. Autumn, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. No, I appreciate you coming on and wanting to talk and share a little bit about your grief and also the dreams that you've had. And looking at your bio, there's so much loss. And I'm curious, what was your idea of grief like before uh, your first loss? And then how has that changed moving forward? I didn't have a clue about grief before I was in my late 20s. In my experience with my life, the only losses I'd really had were a great-grandmother and a grandfather, neither of which I was very close with. And they were sad, but in my mind, it made sense. They were older. And when they were gone, it was sad, but it wasn't life-altering. And so I just kind of thought that people got old and they died and you missed them, but it didn't really change your life or who you were or anything like that. And so it was a pretty big surprise when I actually had that grief that was a lot more, it was a lot bigger part of me. And I realized that grief can change you and change the person you are and change your entire future. But yeah, I didn't have a clue about grief until I had some miscarriages with my husband. And that was my first experience. And at that point, nobody talked about it. So the doctor's like, oh, one in four women have a miscarriage. But nobody talked about it. And so I had assumed that all those feelings and all the sadness and the insomnia and the pain I felt with these miscarriages, I thought something was wrong with me because I didn't know any better. And nobody told me that that's normal and it's okay. And I can talk about it. I don't have to hold it in to myself. And could you talk about that experience a little bit more, those miscarriages and how how you worked through it with you and your husband? Yeah, I wish I could say I worked through it with my husband, but I really I really didn't. We had one healthy son and I ended up having two separate miscarriages. One was of twins, so it was three total babies that we lost within about a year. And I really, I didn't know how to grieve. I didn't know what grief was. I didn't even know I was grieving until probably two or three months after the first one. And I 
didn't want to talk about it with my husband, not because I didn't want to talk about it, because I thought talking about it would make him feel bad. And I thought my job was to protect him from my feelings because I thought I was the one who was broken. I shouldn't be feeling like this. Everybody, tons of people in our world have carriages and they get over it and you never hear about it because it's not a big deal. And so I thought I was the one who was doing something wrong. And so I really internalized it and tried to convince myself that it's not a big deal. It doesn't really mean anything. These babies, which I felt existed, for me, I tried to convince myself that they didn't really exist, that they weren't there. I had nothing to grieve. It's normal. And so I really tried to compartmentalize it. And it took a long time for me to realize that I was, in fact, grieving. And I had to do something to address it. After the second miscarriage, which is the one with twins, my husband did start noticing more that I wasn't sleeping very good. and. I don't really know how it came about, but I came up with the idea to get a little bit of a memorial tattoo for him. And my husband, Joe, he hated, he hated tattoos, but he was really artsy. So he designed this little tattoo with some flowers and some hearts. And I got that. And that was the first step I took towards dealing with my grief was actually marking my body and physically accepting that I lost something and it changed me. I think it's it's great to talk about because you're right. Like a lot of people hear that number, you know, one in four, but you're right. You look around, there's, there's very little group support for people with miscarriages. A lot of people just, you know, minimize it in many ways. And it's interesting how that you tried to go there too. Like you try to go to minimizing your own grief as a way of working with it. Because at first you said it was meaningful. You lost a child and then you're trying to say, no, it wasn't. And you're trying to basically take away the grief by minimizing the loss but i love how you said it didn't work because it doesn't work that's not how (laughs) if it did work i think everyone in our society would be experts at grieving it's but you had to acknowledge it in in your own way and continue a bond with it and and mourn it and i i like the idea of the memorial tattoo we had some people come on here already and talk about it and so can you talk about the decision to, to get the memorial tattoo over maybe some other types of things people do do after a loss? Yeah, I live in a really rural area. So the resources I had, they were pretty limited. And when it came to like losses from miscarriage, the, the one resource group we really have in our rural area is hospice. So it doesn't quite fit with the situation. And then the other resources were just therapist. And I am better at sharing now than I was then, but I wasn't much of a share. I didn't want to sit on somebody's couch and have them ask me how I felt, which was at that point, that was my view of what therapy or coaching or any of that was. And I just wasn't comfortable with it. I didn't think it would help me. And I didn't want to try it, but I knew I needed something to show that I was affected. And it's, the tattoos is very much for myself. It's in a spot where I can look at it and I can see it and I can know that, yes, they existed. These three babies that I never got to meet actually existed and they did change me and they changed me internally. But the memorial tattoo is almost just kind of a beautiful scar that I could create on the outside so other people could see it. And sometimes people ask what the tattoo is or what it means and I share and Sometimes people don't, but it helped me really acknowledge that grief. A lot of people, when they say they get a tattoo, they say it's very addicting. I'll just get more. Did you stop after, or are, are your tattoos only memorial? Or is it something that you've also you know, filled in other spots because now you like tattoos? Got my first tattoo when I was 18. And I'm very much rule follower. And I'm very... I never really rebelled much as a teenager. And so I think when I got my first tattoo, that was kind of my way to assert my own will and be like, hey, I'm going to go do this because I don't have to ask my parents permission. And so I got one when I was 18 and then it was a little bit addicting. And I got another one when I was 19. And at that point, I realized they're really expensive. (laughs) And so I had a bunch of other designs, but I didn't get any other tattoos until, until I got this memorial tattoo. And then since then, I have three additional memorial tattoos. 
I think that's interesting how you continue to use it as a way to processing your grief with all the other losses that came in. And I guess like, why change something that, that works for you? And so do you find benefit when people ask, like, are you willing to share about the losses if someone asks about the tattoo? It's very situational and it depends often on where we are at the time and how much I think they actually want to hear the answer. So sometimes I'll just say, oh, yeah, that tattoo's for my late husband or that's for my daughter. And I won't really say that my daughter passed away and that's why I have this tattoo for. One of my tattoos for my daughter is on my arm and it says courageous miracle. And so that one, if people do ask about it, they're usually asking the context. What what does that mean to me? And that's one we came up with because our daughter, which is actually a daughter with my second husband, who I'm still married to, but she passed away at three months. And her name was Riley, which when we were in the hospital with her, one of the nurses said, Riley means courageous. And we prayed for a miracle for her, but we did not get our miracle, but she was able to be an organ donor. And so she became a miracle for three other families. And so courageous miracle is just kind of one way to remember her and remember her gifts. And so I do, if people ask about that tattoo specifically, I usually do share a lot more than about the other ones. That's beautiful that you got to, you get to create that memorial, if you will, on your body. That's yours. And and you take ownership of that. Yeah. And like I said, I have multiple memorial tattoos, but that one, that courageous miracle one is the only one that's almost always visible. It's on my lower arm so people can see that most of the other ones I always wanted to get them so I could cover them up in my job it's good to be able to cover them up and look a little more professional when I need to but that one I put out there where everybody could see it because the loss did impact me so much and she was with us for such a short time that in some way I do feel that when people see that tattoo or they ask me about it and I can share a little bit about her and a little bit about the gifts she made to those other families that I can help other people know her a little bit more. I think it's a a great time to talk about her some more and the bond that you had and what you were able to experience with her within, I believe it was like three months or something, right? That she was alive. Yeah. 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 It was one of those things I lost my husband in 2015. And by the time he had passed away, we did have another successful child. So I had two sons with him. And I was beyond blessed to meet somebody that helped me grieve, (laughs) and then actually develop a relationship with that person and end up marrying him. And so it took a few years for me to really be able to embrace my grief and be comfortable moving forward with my life even though I have this grief that I'm always going to carry with me for my late husband. And so we got remarried and we decided to have another child because it was just one of those things that just felt right. And we knew that I'd had miscarriages in the past. We knew there could be complications and we said, let's just see what happens. And we weren't going to push it. If there were other miscarriages, we were probably just going to drop the idea, but there wasn't. And we had this pregnancy and everything went perfectly and the birth went good. And we had two little boys that were six and three when she was born. And they were just so excited to have this little sister that they could play with. And it really, we were, we were doing great as a family before she was born, but it really just brought this extra element to this kind of blended family we now had. And we did everything. And I'm, I was always surprised because with the first kid I had, it was like, oh my gosh, this is a lot of work. How do I do all this? I don't even know how to go to the store. And then with the second kid, it's like, okay, I know I can survive one because I did that before. So what's two? But it was still a struggle of trying to figure out how to do everything with kids. And then when she was born, it just worked. Everything worked out really good. And we were happy and we went on camping trips and we went and saw, we went to the ocean and we went to my current husband's brother's wedding and the kids would run around anytime they saw dandelions and just pick all the dandelions and put them in her crib or in her car seat or whatever was near and covered her in flowers all the time. And she was just this little 
happy, beautiful baby that just gave me something that I didn't know I could have again. I didn't know I could go back to being so happy after all the losses I'd gone through with losing my husband and some other people that were close to me. And it was it was just amazing. Everything about it was perfect. She hardly cried. She was a super easy keeper and life was beyond anything I could have ever dreamed. And so when we lost her, it was, it was hard a little bit to not tie her with all the rest of the happiness in our family, because without her, I didn't want that to fall apart, but I'd kind of connected her to this, hey, look at us moving forward and we can still be happy after all these losses. And then she was gone. And so I really struggled with, I I almost felt like I put a lot of pressure on her, but, then, but that wasn't it. It was just, I was blessed with these circumstances and she was amazing. And then learning how to redevelop our family and how to grieve with some pretty young kids. And it was a hard, it was a pretty hard loss for the understatement of the year. Yeah. And so when did you know something was wrong or that it, she could die was it a sudden loss or was it something that you kind of knew within the first month or so no it was pretty sudden she was healthy when she was born we never had any health issues with her and it was the end of october and we all just kind of got colds it was 2018 of course nobody was doing the masks and all the hand sanitizing and stuff which is drop down the colds in our household substantially. But it was just, we had a cold and it was a normal thing and everybody got through it and we could tell when she got it and she kind of stopped eating and we didn't really think much about it, but it got to the point where she was starting to get a little dehydrated and that's all we thought was wrong. And so we took her into the doctor and feel like, you know, she's a little dehydrated. She's not holding her head up quite as good as she was a few days ago, which could be explained by her just not eating very good. And the doctor agreed and we went to go get some IVs in her and she had just the chubbiest little legs and arms that they could not get an IV into her veins. Her veins were small and they couldn't find them. And so what they ended up doing was just admitting us to the hospital so they could put a nasogastric tube through her nose and into her stomach. And we could feed her basically with a syringe through that. And so we stayed up all night with her, my husband, Kyle and I taking turns. And every 15 minutes, we just gave her a little bit of formula through that tube. And in the morning, she was doing good. She was still looking tired, but she was smiling at us and making noises. And all her stats and everything were good. And she still had a little bit of head and neck weakness. So the doctor came in and looked at her and was a little bit concerned. And he goes, you know, I want to test her for meningitis. Maybe she has something else going on. And the test for meningitis, they have to do a spinal tap, basically, and pull some fluids out of it. And they were just going to do it in the room we were in. And they just said, you know, we just ask you to wait out in the waiting room. So we said bye to her. She smiled at us. We said, you know, it'll hurt, but it'll be okay. And we'll be right back. And by the time we'd walked to the waiting room, I think we sat down for maybe five seconds. And there was a code blue for her room. And what we found out later was that the doctor hadn't even started doing the test. He had literally just rolled her over on her side and she stopped breathing and her heart stopped. And at that time we didn't know what was going on and they worked on her for about 40 minutes. And we were right at that point where the doctors were coming and talking to us and saying it didn't look good and that they would keep working on her until we told them to stop. And I don't know if my husband and I talked about it in words, but I know we both felt it's like, how do you tell doctors to stop trying to save your kid's life? And before we had to make that decision, they got our heart going again. And so we kind of had a little bit of a roller coaster where we thought there might be some hope. And we life lighted from our small community hospital to a bigger hospital. And she didn't do very good on the flight. And they had to restabilize her. And there was a ton of swelling. She didn't even look like herself anymore. And they did a CT scan. And they 
were happy to see that her brain didn't look like it had swelled much. So again, we had like a little bit of hope that maybe she'll come through it. And in the end, after about, oh, I think we were in the hospital for three days, they did EEGs and they did a bunch of tests on her and she was declared brain dead at that point. And at that point, we had no idea what ha happened at all. They had no reason. They couldn't explain anything. They were running a bunch of tests to try to see what happened. The meningitis tested end up coming back negative. And what we found out two weeks after she had passed away was that she had infant botulism, which is super rare. But anybody who has kids, especially in the last 10, 15, 20 years, they're told, you don't feed your kids honey. And that's why, because the infant botulism spores are often found in the honey. And so um, that's a normal thing. And we didn't feed her honey. But what they don't tell you is infant botulism. It's just a natural occurring thing that is in microscopic dust. And somewhere along the way, she picked it up. And for some reason, she was more susceptible to it than most other children. In the U.S., there's only about 250 cases a year. And most of those children survive. She was actually only the fourth documented death in the U.S. in the last 20 years. And so it was just a rare thing that not only did we not have time to diagnose her properly, there definitely wasn't any time to treat her. That's, it's so gut-wrenching to hear and thinking back on, on your life and you face so many of these challenges and so many, like you said, you know, like a roller coaster ride of, of feeling great one moment and everything's going well in your family. And then all of a sudden you get hit hard I just can't even imagine the pain and suffering. How did you muster up hope again? I think the main thing I did that helped was uh, losing Riley had come, oh, almost four years after I lost my husband. And so through the process of losing my husband, I had finally learned how to grieve and how to accept the pain and the hurt. And by accepting that pain and the hurt, I also found that I was able to accept the happiness that still existed. I still had two amazing kids and I still had a great family and I still had good things going on. And I had learned that when I try to suppress all the pain and all the bad things and push it down and pretend it doesn't exist, I was also pushing down all the those good things. I was basically trying to just cut myself off emotionally. And so there wasn't as much bad that I was feeling, but there also wasn't that good that I was feeling. And so when Riley passed away, I'd already realized that I need to feel the bad and able to embrace the good. And so going and telling our two boys that their sister wasn't going to come home, that she was dead, I had to be able to sit there on the couch with them and be okay with their whole world being changed and be okay with them bawling and crying and screaming and being mad. Because I had realized at that point that they needed to feel that and I needed to feel all those same feelings myself so that we could embrace the good things that we had, the good things that we had with each other and with our lives in general. And I think recognizing that and trying to allow the other people in my family to, to go through that in their own way, but to go through their feelings was really important. And then the other big thing was my husband, Kyle, and I, we talked about it. We knew that sometimes when people lose a child, it can destroy a marriage. And we knew that sometimes when you grieve, you try to isolate yourself from others. And so we talked about that and we said, hey, this is how I'm going to grieve. This are, these are the things I'm going to do. And we're not going to do it alone. We're not going to go hide in the shower and cry so the other person doesn't see it we're going to be open when we feel horrible because we're dealing with some acute grief and we're not going to keep it from the other person. And I think that was a really big factor also. I just want to say it's, it's inspiring to hear, to hear that and hear your story, to go through what you've gone through and to the courage that you've shown and, 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 and what you're telling us of how you dealt with it. That, that takes tremendous amount of courage and, strength and 
can't even imagine. It's just uh, to have those type of losses and bounce back and be strong for everybody and, and good for you. And, and I commend you and your husband. That's inspiring that you guys decided to have that conversation and, you know, face what's in front of you and understand with a very mature idea around grief that it's it's there, it's here, it's a storm coming and here's the storm and how do we prepare during this time? Yeah, and through everything I went to, I kind of had like a crash course in grief. So over about five years, I lost four people that were pretty close to me and I hadn't known before. I didn't know all the dumb things people would say to me. I didn't know all the dumb things I'd say. I didn't know how to do with my feelings and how to be okay crying in front of other people. And it took a lot of time and it took a lot of effort, but really sitting and being like, you know, it's okay if I cry in the grocery store, I'm allowed to cry because I've been through some hard things and I don't need to be protecting other people's feelings. If my grief makes them uncomfortable, that's kind of their issue (laughs) because I have to feel my grief to, to work my way through it. And that was a really hard concept for me. But once I did feel that, And once I take learned to take the time to be like, okay, I'm, I'm crashing. I can feel it coming. I can feel this big grief wave coming and I need to take the time to sit in it and let it wash over me and feel miserable. I started feeling a lot better. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was running so much from this darkness that was always there. Instead, I felt like I was able to deal with the darkness and find some light and kind of pick my grief up and carry it along with me because I'm never going to get rid of it. But it was really all about just learning to face my emotions and okay with feeling bad, which also meant that I could be okay with feeling good. No, I I love that you got to a point where you could see that. And it took many times, as you said, like you've been through a tremendous amount of loss prior to that. And you're really just trying to figure it all out. And I'm glad you have figured it out in a way that works for you. So you have your tattoos to memorialize these people, but you also said like you've, you've learned some wisdom about looking into the darkness. And that's sort of, I think what your, the title of your book is, you know, boldly into the darkness. And it's quite fitting because, you know, all the different types of loss would it, just one in itself would be enough for, to put someone's life just in complete darkness and take the sun out. But you had so many and for you to be here now to talk about that and be so open about what you what you did, what didn't work, and what worked for you, I think is remarkable that you know if you have if you can get the courage to have conversations about this, to be able to look at the darkness and to sit in it and to not I think the one point two that you made about putting yourself first and not hiding your emotions from others because it makes them feel uncomfortable, I think is remarkable. I'm still learning about that. I do that in different ways where I'll sometimes minimize who I am or even my joys or just life experiences because it may make someone uncomfortable. But it's about, you know, putting yourself first and understanding that you're the only one that's going to be taking care of you, right? So it's nice how you put that, you shifted that focus on yourself because with that, you can then move mountains. You can do a lot of things, you know, with that mentality. And so I'd like to actually go to the book now. So what made you write the book or even think of the idea of writing the book? Was that something that was started prior or was it something after Riley died? After my husband passed away, I kind of started taking notes. Once I started working through my grief and kind of figuring out things that helped me, I kind of just started taking notes and thought, you know, maybe one day I'll write a book. Who knows? I'm just going to put these in a drawer and save them. And I never really considered it seriously. And then after Riley died, I went to a community event. There's maybe 10 people there. And I was asked to speak. And it was called a Know Your Worth event. And really what it was focused on was a group of women coming together. And the speaker would tell about some hard things they've gone through in their life and how they tried to overcome it. And I went into that to that event, I think, with like 20 note cards and I talked for about two hours and at the end of it I looked down and I'd only covered three or four note cards and people were still sitting there and they were still interested and when I stopped they came up to me and kind of said you know your story and hearing you talk about it has encouraged me and at that point I thought you know maybe there's more in my story 
I I had learned to start sharing my story because it helped me because the more I could talk about it and the more I could kind of normalize my grief, maybe it would make a slow change in our culture, at least in my little bubble I lived in. But I never really thought about putting my story out there to help people. And so after that event, I started looking into it a little bit more. And I'm very much a reader. So I already read a bunch of other people's stories. And it just kind of came out that way. I struggled a little bit between like, oh, do I want to be like a self-help type book where there's a bunch of ideas and concepts and checklists for them to go through? And in the end, I decided that just sharing my story, telling them some of the crazy things or what I felt that I was ashamed of or embarrassed about and really putting that out there to the world so maybe somebody wouldn't feel alone and maybe somebody would feel a little bit better in their grief. And so that was really my motivating, the, the motivating thing to write this book. That's beautiful. And I think that's probably probably the main reason why someone would want to pick up your book and read it because you've been through such hardships and often where, you know, that those are the things we fear the most is losing people we care about, losing people we love. And then how do we, how do we live life after that? How do we retain hope? And, and that's, I think that's why people want to hear you speak. People want to read your book on that because you can provide some sort of uh, some sort of help, some sort of information on that unknown that we all have, you know, often the old school mentality is, well, that's your, you know, cross to bear, or, you know, it's your mountain to climb. Support can be weaning, right? And I think we have to change that and understand that there are a lot of people who go through hardships and loss and grief and, to understand that and to also be there to support them however we can support them and especially with what you've gone through is different forms of disenfranchised grief where you're, you're probably not getting the same support that you should be getting but yeah that's that's great and thank you for sharing your story like that because it is something that can help all of us can help us understand the losses around us and not be so frightened i think that's another reason i wrote my story was a and I wrote it as a memoir, was there are a number of grief books. I won't say a lot because I think the resources available for grief are getting to be a lot more, but there's a ton out there. Mm -hmm. But there are those books that talk about grief in a very clinical way. And they kind of talk about checklists when somebody you love dies, these are good things to do. But I thought my book, how I wrote it, where I kind of went into the things other people did that really helped me and how the people who said, hey, call me when you need help, weren't actually helpful. But the people who said, hey, I'm going to come by at five and take your kids for the evening, and I'm going to come back with groceries for you. Is that okay? Were more helpful because it was harder to say no to them because they had a plan and they had specifics and they were actually helping. And by putting that and similar things like that into this book in the form of a memoir, I thought maybe it would reach out a little bit more to people who aren't necessarily grieving themselves, but who are supporting people who are grieving. Because I don't think those people are as, as likely to pick up the step-by-step -step how to deal with grief books and actually read it and pay attention to it as they might a memoir that's a little bit more like a story. Do you have a moment, maybe you wrote in a book, or maybe it's not in there, in either any of your losses where you look back and it's like, or, or during it, you kind of felt embarrassed that you were doing it. We had a guest come on recently where just talked about, you know, some of the more specific aspects and it made me start thinking about other people's loss. So uh, she would uh, sit at a stop sign and not know where she's going. And it was a part of the, the grieving process for her. It was just memory was such a bad, bad thing. And at that moment, were there anything for you that happened that you look back and, and you just, you're kind of, I don't know if embarrassed is the right word, but it's, it's a more specific aspect of something you're dealing with that, you know, it's not a general theme, but something more, you know, like you may not know this about my grief. Yeah. The memory loss thing is completely real. And I've always been very independent and very like self-driven and I can do whatever I want. And I lost a lot of confidence when my husband died. And 
I also just was not functioning good. I drove to my parents' house and they lived about two hours away and they weren't there. They were at work and I just let myself in and I hung out there for probably two or three hours. And my mom pulls up and she goes, are you going somewhere? Your car's running. And I had literally just gotten to their house, got out of the car, didn't turn it off or anything and just left it running in their driveway for hours. I think the one that's the most embarrassing to me was I really struggled with what to do with my husband's underwear. And talking about it now, it seems so ridiculous, <laughs> but we had we had people volunteer to make clo- quilts out of his clothes and bears and pillows and a bunch of these things. So getting rid of his clothes, his normal clothes wasn't difficult. And I was left with a whole bunch of like socks and underwear. Well, socks can go to Goodwill, but who really wants used underwear? And for some reason, that was a really big struggle for me. And I think I ended up just throwing them away, but I tried, I tried to figure out crafts I could make with them. I tried to figure <laughs> out like functional items I could use with them. Like, could they be shop rags? And what I realized was pretty much whatever you do with underwear, they still look like underwear, even if you just cut them into fabric pieces. And so I did throw them away, but that was one of those things that's like, I didn't, I've never heard of anybody dealing with that. They talk about getting rid of clothes in general, but the underwear specifically for whatever reason was a really big thing for me. Yeah, that's so interesting. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, the only I think the only thing you can do is wear it as underwear yourself, and that's <laughs> that's yeah. Really good, right? yeah. <laughs> and so I think now is a good time to talk about dreams. So if you had you've had so many different types of loss. Do you see dreams coming to support or to hinder you through any of the losses? And do you see any patterns that may be mentionable on the podcast? Yeah. I haven't really had very many dreams of my daughter, which I always felt was interesting. I have had, I don't, they weren't actually dreams and they also weren't really just imagining. So I I don't really know how to classify them, but very almost like awake dreams of my late husband and my daughter together. One of the things when she passed away that we found comfort in was that wherever she was ending up, my late husband was there with her. He was going to take care of her just like she, just like my current husband is taking care of his kids down here. With my late husband, though, I have had a ton of dreams and most of them are horrible. I think I've had two dreams where he was there, felt right. And most of the dreams I have are me seeing him somewhere and him not knowing me not recognizing me. Those were rough ones. And I had them a lot more in that first year. They were pretty, pretty consistent, at least once a week. And it was just this huge, like, consistent abandonment feeling. And he died suddenly also. And so in my mind, I also, I kind of assume that it's because I did feel very abandoned by him. He was 30 years old and went for a jog and his heart stopped. And they never found out why. They just said unknown natural causes. And so um, I do think that's part of why a lot of the dreams are just him abandoning me. But it doesn't make sense for him not to recognize me in the dream. So those are probably the main ones. But I've also had other ones where he went missing and I couldn't get anybody to help me look for him. And then months later, I'd find him and he'd still be alive, but just barely. And he'd be mad at me because I didn't. I didn't encourage people or force people to look for him more. Those are very, it's very interesting. And you, you see that a lot, especially after partner loss, which I think is very interesting. Uh, I see it more often anyways, in that, that subgroup. And you're right. It has something to do with the, the the feelings of abandonment and just trying to understand what's going on. Cause it's, it's something that your mind's still trying to work with. Like, how can someone be here one minute and not the next? We have this whole future kind of planned. And we have these kids. And like, this doesn't make any sense. And and the mind's trying to work with those feelings and emotions. But it's sad how you have those negative dreams. Well, other people may have positive dreams of the deceased, reassuring them that like, they're okay, or that they love them. And to almost minimize those types of feelings. But yours is sort of, exaggerating those feelings and increasing them even when you wake up right so they're 
the right away when you wake up and you don't get that sort of respite or relief that some of these dreams provide. Yeah. And it's interesting because I don't have them as often as I used to, but even still, I think I had one last month and I wake up just as like almost traumatized from these dreams where this person I loved and who loved me and I know they loved me and would never leave me intentionally just basically says, yeah, I don't want anything to do with you. Get away from me. You're right. It just re- it can re-traumatize you and minimize sort of that love that's there because that's what you're thinking about. Like this fear that you may be, I don't know, not remembering them as, as you could have, right? Not, and that whole, that whole thing too with starting a new relationship and the new dynamics. And it's nice how it seems that you talk about loss you know, with your, your new partner. But at the same time, it's very challenging to love not just your late husband, but your new husband all at the same time. And in our culture, it's not something that we promote loving multiple people <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. And so having a spouse die, it, there's so many challenges with that and so many things that you're still working through as you move forward in your life with other things because you there's a part of you that doesn't want to forget, but there's so many things that are happening at the same time. And it's like, how do you balance that out? And what I, I would suggest anytime you deal with nightmares and your your themes are very similar, which I think even throughout, mm-hmm. even though they've diminished in some way, it, they're still being triggered in, in points of your life and they're still happening. And so like when I look at that, there's still something going on under the surface that is still wanting to be acknowledged. And there's different ways you can play with that. So like, as you, as you know, you could talk it through, you can try to figure it out. But there's another thing you can do is just by creating a dream you may want to have and or re-scripting those dreams that are occurring to something more positive and comforting. And when you do that, what's interesting is those dreams will not come as frequent if they do, uh, but they could change to something more prevalent. And what's interesting is when you work on your dreams, it can actually help with the grief in many ways. And so it's not like a one direction. It's not like just your grief is determining your dreams, but by working on your dreams, you can actually help your grief. And so this is one of those points that I probably would recommend creating a dream that you'd want to have with your late husband and what that would look like and think about that and what that would be, because that can help a lot with maybe helping with those, those dreams from just not occurring anymore. And helping with the grief that still seems to be being triggered in many ways throughout your process. Yeah, and I've I've started to try to do that here pretty recently. And the concept was pretty foreign with me to start with because, you know, I've always had very vivid dreams that I can't always connect them to things that are going on in my life. But with the grief dreams, of course, that that is very connected and it's very personal. And I've actually have started having those those handful of good dreams that I've had of my late husband have come more recently since I started really thinking about it and thinking, you know, I want to have a dream where he comes and he tells me he's proud of me or he comes and he tells me that he misses me and the kids or that he's watching me and those sorts of things. And I've had a few where he does do that and it really helps. And the other thing that's also helped with it, I've noticed is even when I'm having the the more nightmare type dreams, I've been focusing on the things that are important. And with grief, a lot of times our bodies have a way of helping kind of protect us from that. And one of the ways is you start losing some of those memories of the specifics, exactly how they looked, exactly how they sounded. And it's hard for me to recollect how he sounded or what his laugh was. But in these dreams, I see him and I know him immediately. And so while I might not be able to pull those exact specifics up in my consciousness when I'm awake, I've been able to find some comfort that, you know what, even today, even after he's been gone for six years, if he laughed in a crowded room, I would still know it was him. And so I have been able to get some comfort from that, that recognition that I feel in those dreams. You know, it's it's so beautiful that you're having those positive dreams now, right? Like it, there's something changing within you and shifting. I think mm-hmm. that's beautiful to see because when you look at one dream, it's one thing. But when you start looking at the pattern of dreams over time, you can really see a lot of what someone is going through. And so I'm glad you're having more positive dreams. And 
hopefully you'll have also a dream of Riley in the future too. And so as we usually wrap up the podcast, we always like to ask what dream we'd want to have. You shared a little bit of the dreams you want to have of your late husband. Is there another dream you'd want to have if you could tonight? Yeah, I I would love to have a dream of Riley. I'd love to know that wherever she's at, she's at peace. And the organ donation part of that really helped us. But of course, we made that decision for her. And so like just that recognition that she's happy with the choices we made and she was happy in her three months with us. And just knowing that she's okay. I think that would be a, that would be an awesome dream to have. What age would she be at in the dream? You know, when I imagine her, I go back and forth between her being both a baby, but a lot of times when I imagine her, I see her grown up like as a young adult. And I'm not sure why, but I have a very clear image of what I think she looks like. And maybe, I guess I believe that wherever she's at, her soul is is not an infant age. So I think in the dream, I'd like to, her to be old enough to have an actual conversation with her. Well, that's what I, I see in, in a lot of these dreams, especially with, with child loss, that they, they do different age. And when they are older, they do speak and like in sentence structure, <laughs> like more than yeah. one word. And that's sort of just, you know, they can provide a lot of comfort hearing certain words from the the deceased and they have to be a certain age. It's um, there's only a couple times where it's been like really weird, like a, a couple pet loss dreams where the dog talks to the owner, um, but it's very mm-hmm. rare. It's <laughs> So it's like usually has to go with kind of like reality in a way when it comes to just how they speak. So, yeah, I, I hope you do have that, you know, and you have to let us know if you do, because I think that'd be so amazing to just hear about and hear your expression of what that dream meant. Yeah, I will for sure. Um, I think all the, the stuff you guys are doing on it's just great because it is one of those areas that people just don't talk about very much. And I think there's a a lot of ways to explore it and a lot of ways to work through your grief with your dreams. So I think it's awesome what you guys are doing. All right. We really appreciate you coming on the show and just said sharing who you are and what you've been through. I've learned a lot just about loss in general and, and how it made an impact on you and things I can take forward as I talk to other people i'm curious though where can people find your book and is there anything else you want to share about that this time yeah my book is available in paperback and any of your independent bookstores can order it it's also on amazon if that's the easiest way but um it's great to support an independent bookstore it is also an ebook and an audio book and it's on a lot of different platforms so if you search it up, you're probably going to be able to find it on whatever you prefer. All right. Thank you so much, Autumn. Uh, again, just to uh, reiterate what Joshua was saying, it's been a, a great conversation. And thank you for showing us uh, your courage and strength that you've gone through. I think that what you faced and then being able to share with other people, I think that's so inspirational. And uh, I hope people check that book out. All right. As always, uh, we like to wrap up the podcast uh, with love and gratitude from us to you. Thank you for listening to the episode. We hope you enjoyed it. If you want to know more about the topic, please check out our platform at griefdreams.ca. On there, you can take our two online courses. Number one is a Grief Dreams Workshop by Dr. Joshua Black, which is designed to help you learn all about the topic. And number two is Crazy in Love Using Romantic Relationships as a Vehicle for Growth, which is designed to make you rethink modern intimate relationships. And that's by Dr. Joshua Black and Jade Carling Black. On the website, you can also book a one-on-one Grief Dreams consulting session with Dr. Black. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Clubhouse, at Grief Dreams. And we have two clubs on Clubhouse that you can follow, Grief Dreams and Grief Cafe. If you have Facebook, you can follow our Grief Dreams podcast page to be notified of when we release new episodes. You can also join the Grief Dreams Facebook group to share your dreams or hear more dreams of others. Once again, to help support the podcast, please subscribe and read the podcast on the platform you listen to it on. This helps our show come up when people search for Grief Dreams podcast. Also, you can become a member of the podcast through Patreon. We have three membership levels, $1.50 a month, $7 a month, and $20 a month. And again, this money helps us run the podcast. 
You can find the Patreon link in the show notes. We would like to thank all those who continue to support us. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you can be comforted by your dreams tonight.